I'm pleased to see such an excellent audience for this Verheyden de Lancey lecture. The Verheyden de Lancey lectures are funded by a trust in Jersey in memory of Baron Verheyden de Lancey, who was an extraordinary man, who was at various stages in his career a doctor, a dentist, a barrister, an art collector, a rich man, and a public benefactor. And with his wealth, he caused for to be created a fund to sponsor studies in and interest in medico-legal matters. And the Jersey Foundation generously gave Cambridge some money to fund mainly periodic public lectures on <coughs> medico-legal themes. We've, since I've been involved in organising them, which I have intermittently since 2003, we've had a series of them on different themes. I won't give you a list of all of them, but the first one that I organised with Antje Jubapadine's help was from Elizabeth Butler Sloss, who was president of the Family Division, who talked about recent cases on life and death in the courts. And the last one we had, which I regret to say, was as long ago as November 2011, was Professor Sir Peter Lachman, <coughs> who talked about the effect upon the free availability of new medicines of tort liability of those who supply them. The lectures have been a little intermittent, but they're we envisage them being a more regular fixture because the faculty is in the process of creating a centre for medical law, life sciences and ethics on the basis of a generous gift from two benefactors who also generously endowed a parallel centre in Hong Kong University and we have one person in post and another shortly to be appointed and we envisage that this future centre will probably take under its wing the arrangement of these lectures. The subject today, as you all well know, is euthanasia and assisted dying in the Netherlands, and to talk to us about it, we have the distinguished Dutch criminal lawyer, Professor Paul Mavis from the Erasmus University of Rotterdam, who is part of an official commission which has been created in the Netherlands to investigate the present law and to consider discussions about, consider possible further reforms to it in one direction or another. This is topical as a subject to have to lecture in England because there are proposals and discussions to change the law here. For the benefit of those of you who are law students, let me remind you, and for the benefit of those of you who aren't, let me tell you what the law in this country currently says. Suicide, as throughout in Western Europe, was regarded as a crime, part of a package of crimes that existed because the behaviour was morally condemned by the Church. As far as the person who took his or her life was concerned, that meant here that the body was denied Christian burial <laughs> and was actually desecrated by being buried at the crossroads with a stake through its heart at one time, and the suicide's goods were forfeit to the crown. Could, the person who committed suicide couldn't be brought before the courts, obviously, but genuine criminal liability was created for attempting to commit suicide and people who tried and failed therefore got prosecuted and sometimes sent to prison. And those who helped people take, commit suicide were regarded as complicit in murder and therefore accessories to murder and therefore liable to the death sentence, which occasionally was actually carried out, though usually not. In 1961, suicide was, in turn commas, if I may so put it, decriminalised on the recommendation of the Criminal Law Revision Committee. Professor Glanville Williams, my very distinguished predecessor, was part of this body. 
And I heard him sarcastically say, contrary to predictions, half the population did not immediately take coaches to Beachy Head and jump over. Um, but there was great resistance to decriminalizing uh, suicide, and as part of the package, there was created a new offense punishable with up to 14 years imprisonment of aiding, abetting, counseling, or procuring suicide, which is still in force. This harsh law is softened, as before, and throughout an English criminal law, by two things. One of them is the discretion to prosecute. There's not a duty in the authorities to prosecute. They, the Director of Public Prosecution has a discretion as to whether to prosecute. And secondly, in a case which ends up before a jury, what we call jury equity, that's to say juries give unreasoned verdicts, which could be unreasoned verdicts of acquittal, and sometimes juries acquit just because they feel sorry for the defendant and they don't like the law. And by those two devices, the law contrives to be not as severe as it appears to be. It was nevertheless challenged recently in the courts by various people who either were helpless and people who wanted to end their lives, who, already, who were either already completely helpless and not able to do it and wanted somebody to help them take their lives or who were suffering from degenerative illnesses which they thought would put them in that position. And the best known one was Debbie Purdy who was described in the newspapers as scoring a victory in a case decided by the House of Lords in 2009. Her victory consisted of getting the House of Lords to say the Director of Public Prosecutions should at least issue guidelines indicating when he would or wouldn't prosecute people for complicity in suicide, which he then did. The victory didn't do her any good, however, because if you saw the notice in the newspapers about her death um, at the end of last year, you'd see that she brought about her end by starving herself to death. This being the only method open to her to end her life without possibly creating criminal liability for somebody who helped her. There is, before the House of Lords in its legislative capacity, an assisted dying bill at the moment, which would make it lawful for people who are terminally ill to make declarations that they wish to die, and if these declarations were made, then medical professionals would be allowed to prescribe them medicines that would bring their life to an end, and if necessary, help them to ingest it. Pretty narrow. This bill has been introduced before and not got through the House of Lords. It's halfway through its committee stage at the moment, and one of the people behind it told me last week that it won't make its final stages in the House of Lords this parliamentary session. It will all die when Parliament's dissolved prior to the general election and they'll have to start all over again. So quite likely, like the previous legislative attempts, it won't succeed. What are the reasons for the resistance? Well, the main reason for resistance is ultimately a religious one. Life is a gift from God and it's a sin to reject it. But utilitarian reasons against changing the law are also put forward, a prominent one being the slippery slope argument. The slippery slope argument goes like this. If we create any legislative dent in the principle of the sanctity of life, we won't be able to stop the country sliding from permitting those who wish to die to be helped to die, through to causing people to be killed who don't want to die. And by the time we've got there, the result will be the state will be deciding what useless citizens can be got rid of, and it will be like Nazi Germany, purging society of its useless elements. And slippery slopers are wont to point to countries where the law has been relaxed, 
usually saying, and that's what happens. Look, it's just going to be like that here in this country if we change the law. And among the countries where the rules have been relaxed is the Netherlands, and sometimes the Netherlands is invoked as a shocking example of how it would all go wrong if we change the law here. So it's particularly appropriate that we have Professor Nadis here, who's an expert on the subject, who can tell us what is actually happening in the Netherlands. Just a word, if I may, on my own position, and referring back to the first Verheyden de Lancy lecture, which I was involved in organising, when we had Baroness uh, Dame Elizabeth Butler Sloss, who, as the president of the family division, had just decided a case called involving Ms. B. Maybe this case is known to you. Ms. B was a woman who suffered some terrible blood clot in the, in the, towards the neck, which had paralysed her from the neck down, in consequence of which she was only alive by being kept on a ventilator. And she said, I don't wish to continue to live like this. Please turn the ventilator off. And the hospital said, no, we can't. That would be being complicit in your suicide. And it went to the High Court, and Dame Elizabeth said, you can't treat people against their wish. Artificial ventilation is medical treatment. She can insist on it being stopped. And so it was stopped, and she died. And Elizabeth Douglas Loss said to me in discussion before the lecture, I went to the hospital and I interviewed Miss B. She was wholly sane, wholly rational. What she wanted to do would not have been consistent with my religious beliefs, I'm a practicing Christian, I would have thought it was wrong. But interestingly enough, Ms. B is, was a practicing Christian too, and she'd reconciled it with her beliefs. And I didn't think that it was at all appropriate for the law to force her to do something which wasn't in accordance with her religious beliefs. And I am sympathetic, needless to say, to what Dave Elizabeth Butler Sloss said. That's rather a long introduction. Um, having delayed the start, may I invite Professor Davis to deliver his lecture. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, my dear colleague. Let me first of all uh, say thank you to the Foundation and the faculty for having me here this afternoon, and especially thanks to all who organized the trip for me to come here. Uh, Antje Bergidel and the other persons uh, convulsed in the organization. Thank you very much. And of course, thank you very much for um, uh, attending this, uh, this lecture. Um, I'm a foreigner. Um, my English is not, uh, 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 well, I'm not a native speaker uh, English. I apologize for that. Um, and I'm um, speaking to you uh, at the end of the afternoon. There must be nicer things to do than uh, having um, to attend the lecture. And of course, uh, in a good university, uh, as um, is in mine uh, also. There are all things, uh, all kinds of lectures, etc. So thank you very much for um, having, making time and opportunity to be here uh, this afternoon. And of course, um, I'm very glad and, and honored in a way to stand here in the tradition of my fellow Dutchman, Baron Cornelius von Verheyden de Lancy. He was born in 1889. <laughs> And he studied medicine at Leiden University in the Netherlands. There are people from Rotterdam University who say you are not allowed to mention the name Leiden University. Just say some university in the Netherlands, nevertheless. Um, he's uh, from Leiden University in the Netherlands before he got uh, his medical degree in, uh, in England during the First World War. I couldn't find, I looked for it, I couldn't find whether he served at the front as a doctor in the British Army. Army. If he had, I have no doubt he would have been confrontated with questions on euthanasia um, uh, there. What I'm going to do with you, I'm going to provide you an, um, uh, an overview uh, of some headlines of the state of affairs in, um, in the Netherlands, um, hoping to, uh, well, to, to give you some views and some points of discussions about the situation in the Netherlands, partly it's typical Dutch, it's a typical, typical Dutch uh, situation, so I'm not sure whether it would be um, useful, uh, the, the law, the actual law situation in the Netherlands, 
for uh, the English uh, situation and the English discussion, but uh, that's up to you. I'm going to outline a little bit the law as it stands, how that we get there. There is a certain uh, development before uh, the actual situation that is very relevant. I say something about some discussions um, about um, uh, the termination of life on request and assisted suicide uh, acts um, uh, concerning these, uh, these acts, and I'm going to say something about discussions that go beyond that. Um, I gave you some materials, uh, I hope you have it uh, before you, with some legal text. I'm going to refer to that. Um, it would be wise uh, uh, if you can, uh, can, can read it uh, with us together. It may help you to understand a little bit better the situation in the Netherlands. The actual situation in the Netherlands can best be described um, if we take three key moments in, uh, in, in history. Uh, the first being uh, the provisions of the criminal code, the actual criminal code, which came into force in uh, 1886. Um, the second uh, key moment is a Supreme Court decision uh, dated in November 1984. And uh, the third is, of course, uh, the moment that the termination of life on request and assisted suicide act got into force. That is the 1st April uh, of, uh, of the year 2002. That are the main things I want to um, address on this point of uh, the uh, historical uh, development. I gave you the text of uh, 1886 and I gave you the text of um, the actual uh, uh, text of the provisions of Article 293 and 294 of the Dutch uh, Criminal Code. Um, I, it's worthwhile, I think, uh, to mention uh, that uh, I think you know um, where Britain has a, a common law approach, um, uh, the Netherlands, the continent, has a more civil law approach, or so the written law in the, in the code is more important than uh, the jurisprudence, although, uh, as I said, one of the key moments is a Supreme Court decision, so uh, the difference might be not that as big as you can uh, say that it would be on theoretical uh, grounds. I gave you the, 20, um, the 293 um, provision from 1886 and the text uh, from, uh, from the actual uh, situation. This is uh, 294. And I have made some remarks concerning a comparison of the text of 1886 and the text now, because as you can see, if you compare these two texts, you can find a lot of common uh, uh, elements that has been decided in 1886 and that still are very relevant for the actual situation in um, the Netherlands. That's my text. I'm going to make a few remarks on these um, uh, points of, uh, that are common to the text of uh, 1886 and the actual text. First of all, uh, Article 293, 1886, Euthanasia is a separate crime. It's not manslaughter, it's not murder, it's a separate crime. So a, a, a physician uh, a, a, who commits euthanasia does not commit a murder, he's not uh, charged with a murder case, he's not threatened lifetime or death penalty even. There's a separate um, uh, crime. Um, there is a separate provision because uh, the legislator thought that uh, being it a crime against life, but all requests of uh, the, the victim, um, uh, it, would be, it, it would be wise uh, to have the ma maximum sanctions lowered from 15 years manslaughter to 12 years in the case of euthanasia. As we turn to section 294, you see different things. 294, that's suicide. Suicide as such is not a criminal act. It wasn't in 1886, and it still is not. But assisting suicide is a crime, as euthanasia is a crime, both in the view of the legislature, um, uh, both crimes underlying the same um, uh, penal provision, the same interest, that is the respect for the life of another person. That's the reason why euthanasia and assisted suicide both are in the criminal law. There's no distinction on this point. Um, 
even under the Review Procedures Act, there is still no distinction between these two crimes. But in the end, you will see that in the actual discussion, the point is coming up whether we should not make a bigger legal distinction between euthanasia on one side and assistant suicide in the other. Um, on the other hand, you can see that there is a huge uh, difference in maximum sanction. Euthanasia is more or less manslaughter in a lighter version. Um, manslaughter, maximum imprisonment, 12 years, euthanasia, uh, sorry, 15 years, euthanasia, 12 years. On assisting suicide, it was in 1886, and it is still maximum imprisonment, three years, which is very low in the Dutch um, uh, perspective. It's, um, it, for instance, means that um, pre-trial detention is not possible uh, into the crime of uh, assisting suicide, and there should be a minimum a maximum sanction of, uh, of four years. So it's really a different crime, assisting suicide. It's seen as a different crime. It's treated as a different crime, crime um, not in being uh, uh, a, a crime as such. Both are uh, under criminal law provisions, but um, there is um, it, it, the severeness of the crime is, uh, is seen um, uh, completely different. And uh, you can see this a distinct view on another element in the definition of uh, Article uh, 294. There is this element, and you can see in the text, that assisting suicide is only a criminal offense if the suicide follows. Without suicide, there is no criminal offense under Article 294, which means that a doctor who is convinced that his patient can be put at ease by saying, yes, I'll put you the medicine, I'll give you the drugs, I'll put you the medicine ready. If you want to end your life, I'll help you by giving the drugs. And if there are some cases, if he is convinced that exactly giving her the possibility, giving him the possibility, that would reassure his or her patient that he will not take the medicine. There are cases where people say, I'm quite at ease, I can take my drugs, I know they are there, that's enough. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow, and tomorrow it seems that they say, well, maybe next week, or maybe next month. That doctor that provides that drug in that insurance is not criminal, because Article 294 says it's only criminal when the suicide um, follows. So that's some remarks on the legal provision. As I said, there are some, some legal provisions that go back on decisions of the legislator uh, ever since 1886, and they have never been disputed since. They are still uh, headlines of the actual system. Then again, um, what happened, what brought us to um, the actual situation, the actual act, and that's where we get to this Supreme Court decision of November 84. There you have to understand a little bit of Dutch society. Based on a very intensive and comprehensive debate being conducted in literature, in media, in politics, it can be concluded that somewhere in the late 70s, so before this decision, late 70s, early 80s of the last century, there was a certain consensus in the Netherlands about the desirability of decriminalizing euthanasia and assisted suicide in certain cases of exceptional medical suffering. There was an agreement in society. The subject was debated by a variety of interest groups and professional groups, and in terms of legal development, it was of particular interest that some legal lawyers, former members of the Supreme Court, um, if you Google on the name Enschede, I can hardly uh, ask you to pronounce that in the same way as I do, uh, and the name uh, Drion, there's a famous, very, very uh, uh, um, uh, big lawyers uh, uh, with a great of influence, and they made a case uh, stating that euthanasia and assisted suicide should be acceptable in certain, uh, certain uh, um, uh, circumstances. That was really uh, very important. But precisely because of the extensive and comprehensive nature of the debate, there was very little agreement about the cases or situations to which decriminalization should apply, the way in, 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 the way in which this decriminalization should be provided for by law and who should have the authority to decide 
or to carry out euthanasia in the cases. So there were a consensus, yes, we should change the law, but the question, and what are we going to do then, that uh, there was no consensus on that. And although there was a certain support in society for an exemption from criminal liability with respect to euthanasia and assisted suicide, there was for a long time no parliamentary majority for the change of law. You must know that we live in, well, let me put it in a sophisticated way. We have a system of coalition government, and uh, ever since the Second World War, it was in a way inevitable that the Christian Democrats were in the government, and of course they blocked all agreements <clears throat> on these kinds of law. It happened that the, it, it was seen as a miracle that they were outside of the government uh, in the 80s and the 90s, so that was the moment that the, the Socialist Party and the Liberal Party uh, formed a majority and they tried, and with success, um, tried to change the law on euthanasia. Given the political impasse at that moment, it was not surprising as such that the Supreme Court looked for ways within the existing system of codified at criminal law and criminal procedure law in which it could end the punishability of euthanasia and assistant suicide in certain cases. Um, we accept from, as I said, we have a civil, civil law system, but we accept from our Supreme Court that in certain cases where there is a certain majority in society and where there is an impasse in the legislature, the legislature can't, uh, can't decide. Um, there, there is a certain room for the Supreme Court, even in the civil law approach, within the system and within the structures and within the wording of the actual court to try and interpret uh, the criminal court, the wording uh, of the code, uh, into the direction that would be acceptable for society, that would mean uh, more or less a change in law. This was not the first, it was the first decision on the topic of euthanasia and assisting suicide, but by far it was not uh, the first decision in that direction. The Supreme Court has a certain um, room for maneuver within uh, certain structures uh, to uh, changing. And they took up, they took up this point um, um, they, they, they saw that the uh, legislature was not ready to decide, there were a lot of discussion, but more or less there was a uh, consensus in society. And that's um, where they found um, a um, solution. Um, the ruling passed by the Supreme Court on the, on the, in November 1984 um, is the case in which the court provided scope for non-punishable euthanasia and assisted suicide. Its formulation of the exception is based on the written general ground for exception in section 40 of the Dutch Criminal Code. It's in your, um, in your text. Any person who commits an offense under the compulsion of an irresistible force shall not be criminally liable. This provision is interpreted as including the justification, uh, justification defense of necessity. That's the key word of the case of the Supreme Court, necessity. Being a situation in which a person has to choose between conflicting duties. And the court ruled that if the person in such a situation obeys the most important one and violates by doing so the criminal law, his act can be justified. And in this formulation, the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality um, are applied. The court found, concerning euthanasia and uh, assisting suicide, the court found that a medical doctor, and only a medical doctor, acting in such a, a conflict of duty situation and based on objective medical opinion and on medical ethical principles may justifiable opt for euthanasia if there is a conflict of duties between, on one hand, the duty to comply with the law and refrain from performing acts that end the life of another person, and, on the other hand, the duty uh, to prevent in accordance with medical ethics and based on objective medical, medical opinions, unbearable medical suffering on the part of the patient. So they created a uh, justification, um, necessity, um, and seeing a conflict of, uh, of uh, duties, uh, the doctor um, having uh, to um, prevent his patient from unbearable suffering, um, but within 
uh, uh, standards of a medical profession and on the basis of principle and accepted principles of medical um, uh, uh, ethics. I just have to take my PowerPoint presentation. Here are we. Let me see. Yes, sorry. Yes. Uh, this is the ground um, for the court that the court found for the exception for criminal liability for euthanasia. In the context of a duty, medical duty of conflict situation available to a medical doctor for an act that in itself remains a criminal offense. But the system is, it is a criminal offense, but there is a justification called necessity. I leave out the details of the court rulings. It led to a system with a lot of jurisprudence and it was elaborated by the Supreme Court and by the lower court in all kinds of directions. But I leave that out because um, the, um, the, the, um, the approach that the court uh, choose uh, in, in this situation, um, leaving euthanasia and um, assisting suicide within the criminal law, leaving it um, uh, an, an offense, not decriminalizing it in taking it out of the criminal code, but leaving it there and creating a, um, well, an exception, a justification that was exactly the system, but in another way elaborated that was accepted by the legislature in this Review Procedures Act in 2002. The main articles are again um, in your, um, in your uh, uh, text. And the impunity is structured as follows. Um, under the new sections 293 and 294 of the, key, of the penal code, euthanasia and assisted suicide remains, as I said, in the criminal code. So the main element in the Dutch system still is both are criminal offenses. And the main control system in the Dutch system, again, is the criminal system. That's the starting point. The Review Procedures Act did not alter this uh, qualification. Nevertheless, the legislator created a special ground for justification. They, not, they did not lean, as the Supreme Court did, on the general um, justification of this defense. They created a separate, specially for the Articles 293 and 294, created um, a ground for um, uh, for Im uh, immunity. The legislator abandoned the approach based on necessity as a general uh, justification of law. The formulation of the ground for exception for criminal liability in the penal code, that's especially article 293 paragraph 2, that's the key point where it's all uh, uh, about, it's in your text, you can see there that there are three distinct conditions. First of all, the exception is only there for a doctor. No one else can address this defense. It's only created for a doctor. That's uh, in accordance with the Supreme Court. And we all only allow an exception on the basis of medical norms and uh, in accordance with um, uh, principalities, uh, principles of, uh, of medical, uh, medical ethics. The second one is that the uh, penal code makes clear that if a doctor wishes successfully to invoke the ground for exception from criminal liability, he must, he must report his um, act of euthanasia or assisted suicide to the munici municipal forensic pathologist. So the doctor must report that's an essential criteria. He must be open, and that might lead to an assessment of what he did as being no longer an offense on the uh, Article 293 and 294. And the third element in this paragraph 293, uh, Section 2, is that the doctor must meet the requirements of due care set out in the Review Procedures um, Act. I won't go into that act uh, in the moment uh, with you. So there you have it. There you have the system. Um, a special uh, um, um, arrangement in the criminal court referring to a special act. 
What are the requirements of due care under the Review, review Procedures Act to which the penal code um, refers? Well, they are more or less obvious, and you can find them in Article 2 of um, the uh, Review Procedures um, Act. Um, I just read them out, but you can see them. Reached, uh, the doctor should reach the firm conclusion that the patient had made a voluntary and well-considered request. Decision of the doctor on a well-informed uh, request. The doctor has reached the firm conclusion that the patient was experiencing unbearable suffering and there was no prospect, there is no prospect of improvement in this situation. There you have the two key elements, uh, voluntary uh, request in the situation of unbearable suffering with no <laughs> prospect of improvement in the situation. And then you get more or less certain criteria that are more or less uh, a little bit more procedural that the doctor has to inform the patient uh, he has to consult another doctor and he has uh, of course he has to carry out the euthanasia and the assisted suicide within due medical care and attention um, but there is a big difference in the situation after the act and that is, of course, the way in which the, the act of the doctor is assessed. Uh, before the act, uh, there was an option in criminal law. There was a justification, but the only instance that could say that there was a justification was the criminal court. So the doctor had to be prosecuted, and then the court had to say, yes, in this case, the justification of necessity is there. And that, of course, is a big problem because the doctor has to go to court, he has to be prosecuted, he will be in open trial, he, will, he would be charged, etc. So the Review Procedure Act did not alter, in a way, the substantial criteria that the Supreme Court accepted in the 1984 decision, but in uh, essence they changed uh, the way in, was, in which the act of the doctor is assessed. In the, in the uh, uh, new act you can find this a multidisciplinary assessment committee, they will say, they will teach, they will review the act of the doctor, they will conclude whether the doctor did upheld the criteria of Article 2 of uh, the act, as they found, as this committee, multidisciplinary, there is a lawyer in it, we are always there as a lawyer, of course it has to be because it is a justification under criminal law. A lawyer, a doctor, and an expert on medical ethics. These three form, in all cases, this um, review committee. We have five in the Netherlands. We have we have five regional um, committees. If the committee says yes, um, we think that in a certain case the uh, doctor uh, met with all the criteria, then um, the case is over. The public prosecutor will not be informed. Theoretically, the public prosecutor could prosecute, uh, prosecute a doctor because it's the well, it's still the criminal act, so um, it's not a binding decision. The committee says, in our view, this was in according to the law, but there has never been a doctor prosecuted uh, in, in, in a case that the criteria were upheld. In the other situation, if the assessment, the review committee says, well, we think in this case not all the criteria are, up, uh, are upheld, then they leave it to that. They don't give an opinion whether there should be prosecution. They leave that to the prosecutor. The case is handed over to the prosecutor, and then the prosecutor has to decide whether there is a case to prosecute or not. And it's very, uh, um, it depends. I'll say something about that um, in, in uh, short, short notice. Um, it's, it more or less depends, the decision depends on exactly on what criteria the uh, review committed the committee thought that um, the doctor did not upheld the criteria of law. So that's the system. Uh, within the criminal law system, we have more or less a review committee being, if you want, more or less a front office for the prosecution. They made the first, outside public prosecution, they made the first assessment, um, and if uh, they found that the doctor upheld the law, then um, it's that, then we leave it uh, to them. That's the system that we now have. It's completely based on an act of a doctor in accordance to medical ethics, to medical standards assessed by a committee. So that's very limited. 
um, and it still is a provision under criminal law. We trust doctors to do so. Doctors accept this, this, this system. Um, they found they, they think there are cases where they can um, make the decision to uh, go all the way with the patient in euthanasia or in um, assisting suicide. Um, they have developed uh, their standard norms uh, for this situation. And I think that's very important. They accept from each other that other doctors do not have the same opinion. The whole system is based not absolutely not on the right of a patient. It's all based on what we allow doctors to do in accordance with their standards. And the law always says the doctor can act. The doctor may assist in suicide. And within doctors, there is room for the one doctor to say, yes, in this situation, I think uh, it would be possible uh, to help my patient to suicide. When another doctor says, no, uh, for me, for personal reasons, or for medical or standard reasons, whatever, I'm not so far <coughs> yet. So there is, within um, our system, our health system, um, the doctors have, have taken up this point, the, the complete approach, leaning on doctors, and um, ready to report uh, cases of euthanasia and assisting suicide. It's, um, well, it's more or less working because that, of course, is the big question. Does it work? I would say, in a way, yes, in a way it would, and that's not, um, that's not too bad as, uh, as such. Um, first of all, doctors do report. I think that's the main success of the Dutch system and the main element of the Dutch uh, system. As a criminal lawyer, one could ask questions, but it's typical the pragmatic Dutch approach that we don't ask difficult questions as long as there's no necessity for it. So we'll leave that question there. Um, there are some research, there are some uh, surveys. I gave you the English, uh, surf the English uh, um, <laughs> summary of some in, uh, in, uh, in the text. You've seen my email address uh, on the first slide. If you have any questions, uh, uh, I'm, uh, to a certain extent, ready to, uh, to answer them. Um, there are some surveys from which we can more or less re re reliably conclude that up to in 80%, 80% of cases of euthanasia and assisting suicide, they really are reported by doctors, which is very high, and it's rather high over the years. So there's a success. So the, the, the key point, right, we trust doctors uh, to report cases. Yes, that's a success. Nevertheless, there is a gray area, a gray area between euthanasia and palliative sedation. Um, there are cases um, where it's not clear. Palliative sedation is accepted as normal medical treatment. There's no problem, there's nothing to report, there is no criminal offense whatsoever. And of course the problem is there that doctors can define cases, can see cases, can accept cases, or can even um, not with, with immediately um, bad thoughts, um, but can see what we lawyers would see as euthanasia, they could see as palliative sedation. And the difference is somewhere there where doctors say, well, in cases of palliative sedation, I am not, I'm not looking, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not killing my patient, I'm not looking for his death, I try to help him, and yes, the result may be that he dies a week earlier, something like that, but that's not what I'm aiming at. Uh, I'm aiming at a release of pain. Well, yes, of course, but well, there are, of course, cases where we criminal lawyers would uh, see that as intentionally killing another, which might be, as it is on request, uh, a form of euthanasia. So there is a gray area, and in my view, the gray area is a little bit. There are some figures, the figures are not, um, uh, uh, not, not, not clear, but the, the, there might be some 2% of all dying cases where there is something unclear whether is this um, normal medical treatment called palliative sedation or is this a criminal act called euthanasia or uh, assisting suicide. So there is a certain uh, problem, a weak point uh, uh, there. Um, 
in um, the year 2010, the committees, um, where is the, there, no, in the, um, between 2007 and 2011, so four, four years, um, out of a total of 13,918, 13,918 cases, they reviewed this committee, there were exactly 36 handed over to the public prosecutor as um, being cases where the committee said, we don't think that all the criteria were met there. So that is very few. Is that a success? Yes. Um, nevertheless, one might um, come to the conclusion that, report, that uh, doctors seem to report more or less um, well, um, excellent cases, the best cases, clear cases where there is now uh, discussion. 36 cases out of 13,900, that's a little bit. You, you, could, you could see, you, you, there is a discussion, do these committees um, uh, um, assess, review strict enough? Um, we accept it so far, uh, as I said, um, euthanasia and assisted suicide still under criminal law. Uh, the prosecutor can prosecute even when the committee says this is in accordance with the law. If the prosecutor says yes, but, but you reach that conclusion in an interpretation of the law, in an interpretation <laughs> of the criteria that we do not accept, then the doctor might be prosecuted. We did not have any cases of that. So there is more or less um, there is more or less the success of this uh, law being uh, uh, accepted. Nevertheless, in these 36 cases, none of them have led to criminal, and 36 where the, where the committee says the criteria were not upheld, were not met, um, out of these 36, no one was prosecuted. No case was prosecuted, no doctor was prosecuted. That makes me a little bit suspicious as a criminal lawyer, to put it mildly. Of course, as I said, uh, if you look to these criteria, you can see two more or less substantial criteria, request and suffering. And in these 36 cases, there are a lot where the last criterion is not uh, uh, upheld. The last criteria is uh, the, the way in which the uh, euthanasia um, and uh, assisting suicide uh, is committed. Well, that, of course, is not immediately a criteria that leads uh, to the conclusion that if it's not met, uh, there is a serious uh, offense. And it's not only substantial level. Nevertheless, there have been cases where a doctor did not consult, as is one of the criteria, did not consult a second doctor. And still, the prosecution saw no ground for prosecution. As in England, the prosecution prosecutor does not have to prosecute. There is room for maneuver. Nevertheless, as I said, let me put it um, very, very, um, a little bit in, in, in this way, carefully. Um, out of 36 cases where the criteria were not met, no prosecution, that makes me suspicious. I, I would really like to know more about what happened in these cases. I'm going to do some research in the next years, so I'll be back in a few years, there's another reason to do that, um, which uh, I'll come um, um, to that uh, uh, later. One could conclude, one could conclude in general that it works, the system works for what I could say the standard case, what we could say the standard case. The standard case is a mature patient, heavily suffering, cancer, from a medical source, a medical, medical uh, disease which does not affect him mentally. He knows mentally what he's doing. He's capable of um, making his own decisions. And he is suffering in a way that can be recognized by the doctor, by others in his surroundings as unbearable and uh, without any perspective. And that's the standard case. That's the majority of cases in which you, by far the majority, some 85%, that are this um, standard case um, uh, where uh, people um, got uh, euthanasia and um, normally have the expectation of life less than a month. So it's really cancer not affecting the mental capacity in the end version and then euthanasia is a way of preventing further um, uh, suffering. 
That's the big majority of cases in the Netherlands. Therefore, we have a modality that is accepted within the Netherlands because the prosecutor has a huge discretion. We accept uh, this system of um, having some acts under the criminal law, but exactly because it's a criminal law, exactly because the procuracy has a possibility to deal with that, we don't actually apply criminal law as long as certain criteria are upheld. Um, if I look in this audience, it's a little bit dangerous to say it this way, um, I see people of different age. Um, some of you, I don't, I won't conclude which category, but some of you must have been in the Netherlands and know something about what a Dutch coffee shop is about. Um, <laughs> yes, well, a coffee shop is everything else than coffee. If you want a cup of coffee, you don't go to coffee. This complete system is based on the same principle. Everything that is happening in the coffee shop is under criminal law. <coughs> it's, under, it's explicitly kept as a criminal offense. Nevertheless, that means we could apply criminal law, but we don't, the prosecutor doesn't, as long as a coffee shop, holder, uh, a coffee shop uh, uh, owner met certain criteria, uh, which of course differ than these from euthanasia. There are criteria <laughs> like <laughs> the criteria there are no hard drugs, no minors, um, take care that the neighbors uh, 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 do not, uh, do not uh, 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 get annoyed, uh, no alcohol, etc. So a coffee shop is an ongoing criminal offense, but it's more or less tolerated. There's the Dutch approach. Exactly the same, more or less, exactly the same. Uh, we take that approach. That's the machinery that we take for euthanasia. But within this machine, machinery, it's only the doctor that has a possibility to uh, apply for um, uh, acts of euthanasia and, su and assisted suicide that is not um, criminal. So the standard case, we handle the standard case, but of course that leads to a lot of discussion about the not standard case. And we should be a little bit reluctant. You will hear a lot of discussions on the Netherlands. That is this picture of uh, in the Netherlands, uh, we had some, some people, I, I, I'm not sure, I thought they were from America, uh, they had to make a, a, a stop over at Zippo Airport in Amsterdam, and they asked me before, well, I'm over 80. Uh, I am safe in the middle of the They are stop there. They are deep in the middle of the etc. Well, that's not the case. There are some discussions, as I said, standard case. That's, there's no discussion uh, uh, about that, and that makes out of uh, that, that makes some 85%, something like that, of uh, the cases. What are um, the, um, um, uh, the categories outside the standard um, uh, case? Well, first of all, I won't say too much about it, but if you read um, uh, section 2, paragraph 2 uh, of the Act, then you can see there are some lines about the advanced directive. And if you read that, you can, of course, um, imagine that that gives some problems. How far does such an um, advanced directive go? And how far may and you say you see there the same construction? If there is an advanced directive, it says the doctor may use that directive. He may act upon that directive, but that directive is only one of the criteria. The doctor should be. Um, convinced that all the criteria are met in the situation. Well, that's an unclear situation. There you have this compromise idea again uh, in our act. That's an, an, an unclear uh, situation w that we are discussing at the time. The other one is minors. Um, of course, uh, as such, uh, minors cannot regress uh, suicide. Uh, or uh, euthanasia um, uh, without, well, the, 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 the section is that between 12 and, and 16 years, uh, a minor um, uh, 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 cannot ask for euthanasia and assisting suicide without uh, the, um, um, 
the, have the decision of, uh, of the parents. It cannot, uh, the, it's the parents to decide. There are cases now where doctors say, we have seen minors 15, 14 years from, from their cancer, in a way, more mature to bear their suffering, to handle their suffering, than their parents. There are cases where doctors say, the patient is taking his suffering, his cancer, his death. The parents are in the situation of complete denial. We can't discuss it with them. But they say, no, no, we don't want to talk about it. Et cetera, et cetera. There's a certain problem. And we have a court case where parents are divorced and where one says yes and the other says that's why I say no. And the other said no, the other says. So there are some cases coming up and the doctor say, I see the patient is a minor, but in a way he handles his situation by far more mature than some parents. That's there were some reports that this was one of the problems. Then the case of others than medical doctors. As I said, the whole system is based on um, a decision. The only um, justification possible is the decision of a doctor. We had a case where a non doctor <coughs> assisted his mother in suicide. That's the rule of facts. There's no justification, the act is not uh, uh, applicable. So the prosecutor prosecuted. And the court said, yes, it's a criminal offense. No, there is no reason for any sanction. Saying, we recognize here that it was addressed, and uh, we recognize here that yes, this is a criminal offense, but in the circumstances of this case, uh, we accept uh, more or less uh, the assisting uh, of uh, the, 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 the assistance of this son, this careful assistance of this son. Um, in, uh, in helping his, uh, his mother. Of course, that will lead to more discussion. If the court says, hey, here you have, uh, you hear the, the, the echo of the, the uh, uh, court decision uh, from 1984, uh, courts see discussion in society, and courts try to, well, to find a solution. A solution here might be, yes, it is criminal, but no reason for sanction. And of course, in the next case, the prosecution has to think three times um, before he prosecutes, when the end might be, yes, it's criminal, but no um, sanction. And then again, the last version of discussion, then we go beyond the scope of um, the uh, medical approach. Uh, actual system, accepted in society, let me stress that again, standard case that we accept, there is a discussion, and not the picture as we are going to kill everybody, etc., etc. There is a discussion, nothing more yet, about what is um, um, known as completed life. People who just have the feeling, my life is completed. I'm not suffering from something medical as such, but um, uh, uh, my life is uh, completed. Um, let me. Add, sorry, let me add one word um, on the, the first bullet here, the scope of lasting, of lasting and unbearable suffering. Um, the case of dementia, of uh, uh, people who suffer from, um, uh, not from, from somatic suffering, but um, who are mentally disturbed in a way. It has never been excluded that that might be suffering in the meaning of uh, the act. So also mentally suffering, suffering from mentally um, disorders can lead to the suffering as mentioned in the act. As you see in the act, there is no, no uh, limitation of suffering to uh, cases of only somatic suffering. There are only very few cases. All of them are assessed as being within the scope of the world. Um, there are some, in the jurisprudence of this review committee, there are some lines of well, more cautiousness, more, more careful decision. Um, if a patient is um, claiming euthanasia or assisting suicide, suffering not from a somatic uh, disease, but from mentally disorders, or 
we are more reluctant in that, but it is as much possible. It's not included, it was not excluded by the court in 1884, in uh, 1984, and it's not excluded in um, the um, actual uh, law. Nevertheless, there still has to be a medical ground for the suffering, and the case of completed life is um, the discussion about what would be behind medical grounds, what would be the situation that people just say, I'm not suffering, but my life is completed. I have just, uh, my life is over, but my body is still there, that's it. Well, there is discussion, and there is this committee um, where I um, have the honor to be a member of. Um, there is discussion, um, uh, and the um, instruction to the committee is the committee will carry out the aforementioned study into legal possibilities with respect to assisting an individual who considers his or her life to have run its course in committing suicide, and we also an analyze the social dilemmas in this context. The study's core focus will be on how the, the wish of a growing group of people in the Netherlands to have a greater right of self-determination in terms of the assistance to be received when they have made an end-of-life decision can be met in practice. At the same time, it is of paramount importance that abuse is prevented and that people feel free and feel safe. So here you have the reluctant approach. We are talking about it, and you see the key word here, self-determination. The system in the Netherlands still is very, well, let me say it positively, based on the doctor's decision, there is no right to euthanasia, there is no right to assisted suicide, there is no um, um, right to um, self-determination in law. There are possibilities for a doctor based on medical standards. That's the actual situation. If we would go, if we would accept this concept of um, complete life, then the basis, the only basis, can be, of course, um, the um, right of self-determination, which would be a huge step, not only in a change, not only be a change in the underlying theory of why we accept euthanasia and uh, assisting suicide in certain cases, but of course it will, I hope I made it a little bit clearer, it will change the complete system of control and criminal law controlling because that is all based on a doctor's decision now um, and the doctor is the only one who can call for justification. And the first criteria is he has to report his cases. How are we going to set up such a system of um, uh, acceptance and reporting if um, the decision as such um, is um, in the line of self-determination, based on self-determination and not on other grounds? There we see for the first time, as I said in the beginning, that we, we have treated so far euthanasia and assisted suicide always together. Both are a crime, both are under this act, the criteria are exactly the same. Here for the first time people argue that if we would go to the concept of completed life, then it might be for the first time uh, better to make a bit of a distinguish uh, between these crimes and allow only assisted suicide in cases of completed life. The committee is still discussing and thinking to put the party. Um, not on the one, because all of the members is for a while uh, abroad. Thank you very much for being here uh, again. But we will uh, continue to discuss. The report can be expected in the second half of this year, and I can guarantee you that there is at least a summary in English, if not um, the complete report can be translated. That, of course, is a question of money, and that's always a very sensitive topic in the Netherlands. Let me make some conclusions. Um, I hope to make clear that in a way we have more or less typical Dutch provisions coming from an um, accepted discussion and accepted uh, uh, situation in the Netherlands. Um, the act is a success for the standard case, which nevertheless make out 85%, something 80-85% of all cases, so it is a big success. It is seriously debated for other cases. Some say we go too far. There are people who say, well, mentally suffering from mentally disorder, this is very, very complicated. That, that there is a certain call for, do we not go too far? 
Others say, no, we don't go far enough, but this case of completed life should be made possible. Again, I uh, underline we are only discussing that there is not a, um, um, a majority, a consensus uh, on this point of completed life in society as it was before the Supreme Court ruling in um, 19, um, 1984. Um, well, the big question is in how far can we, do we want to keep up the actual system based on the decision of a doctor, based on a medical decision, controlled over the system of being a medical decision, with an obligation for the doctor to report all cases. Maybe we move, I don't know, more to a right on self-determination. If we go in that direction, that would mean a complete different system, and that alone uh, would take some time and consideration. Maybe there will be a bigger distinction between euthanasia and assisting suicide. I know that I gave you a lot of information about the Dutch situation. That's why I gave you the text. Maybe you can rethink it over again. The risk, uh, if you go to the internet, a lot of uh, literature in English about uh, the Dutch uh, uh, situation. Nevertheless, I hope to have to give you some uh, overview and even illuminate a little bit that we have a rather strict system under criminal law. You cannot come to the Netherlands, have an intake interview at the clinic at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and bring your corona at 3 o'clock or something. That's absolutely not out of the question. Now, doctor will do that. Thank you very much.